and welcome everybody to a new video from Jockler 66 Hour of the Truth. This is the 15th reading, if I am not mistaken. <laughs> I just checked it, yeah. It's the 15th reading of the wonderful book The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. And uh, we have come now to the Second World War. I had a little time to prepare the readings um, just because you know, I had uh, a tooth operation in the beginning of the week and that made it difficult for me to speak. It's still a little bit swollen, my cheek on the right side, and I hope that you will understand me well and that I can pronunciate everything the way that I want to because I still have a little, uh, a little pain there and um, it's swollen and I, it, it's not that comfortable for me to speak. I have a little tea here that I'm sipping during the reading, so don't get disturbed by that. Anyway, we have today the 20th of January 2018, 2018, and I'm going to bring to you the next recording, the next reading of the book from Edmond Paris, uh, The Secret History of the Jesuits. But before I even go into that and start that, I want to tell you that I have planned somewhere during this recording, I mean, probably not this edition, this 15th reading, because I don't think that we get there in time. But during the reading of the preparations for the Second World War, as Chapter 2 of uh, the Infernal Cycle here is uh, named by Edmond Paris, during that we are reading about the Second World War, I will switch to another book, as you can see here on the top of my PDF that I opened, the Adobe Reader, this new version allows you to open multiple documents in one. Uh, I like that. I never had that, but that's one of the features with my new computer that this works now. And um, I will include the reading of Chapter 7 of The Secret Terrorists by Bill Hughes from page 50 on, which deals about the Second World War. This is about seven or eight pages. I've read that on beforehand. I will not comment while I'm reading that, that's not the idea, but it is to include what Bill Hughes uh, has to say in his book The Secret Terrorists about World War II, to combine that with the secret history of the Jesuits. There are some things, of course, that you will learn double, but there are some things that Bill Hughes goes into in his, into his book that uh, Edmund Paris doesn't, and therefore I think it is quite interesting to see these both things combined and, um, you know, um, to learn even a little bit more about World War II as just from Edmond Paris, as we, of course, learn from his book here. Now, uh, let me see that I can put up the picture for the reading. So, and then we are going to start right now on page 122 in the PDF of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits, which is page 123, as you can see in the actual book, probably. Even though I have the book, uh, Brett Norman was so wonderful to send me this book as a gift, I decided to take this desktop camera to record the rest of the book reading. And, of course, then I cannot use the actual book, but I will always keep that for in reference, and here and there it is nice to have a read on that. So anybody who has the money to buy this book, I can only advise you to get it into your hands. And of course, otherwise you can download the book for free on the internet. From the internet, I provided the download links for the free PDF in the description box of this video. But now, without any further ado, I'm going to start reading section 5, chapter 2, which is still called uh, The Infernal Cycle, The Preparations for the Second World War. Now, in 1919, the sons of Loyola reaped the bitter fruits of their criminal politics. France had not succumbed to the thorough bleeding. The apostolic empire of the Habsburgs, which they had encouraged to punish the Serbians, had disintegrated, liberating the Orthodox slaves, uh, Slavs, sorry, the Orthodox Slavs, from the yoke of Rome. Russia, instead of coming back to the Roman fold, had become Marxist, anti-clerical, and officially atheistic. As for invincible Germany. It foundered in the chaos through the Weimarer Republic, which we are still suffering under today, that that ever happened. 
so many reasons I don't even want to go into that but when you s think that even something didn't work out for the plans of the Jesuits while reading this then I'm gonna tell you think again everything worked out for according to their plans okay they did not get Russia back into unto the Roman fold well what's the best next thing to further annihilate and exterminate the Orthodox Russians and therefore they installed communistic uh, the communistic system based on quote-unquote Marx and Engels with Lenin and later on Stalin during the Second World War communism was not new you know that of course because you are a <laughs> listener to the channel of Jogla 66 an hour of the truth and you know if that we've read before about the reductions of Paraguay in the 16th and 17th century and that of course that was the beginning of communism there they let's say planned and there they played for the first time what they would later implement with quote-unquote Marx and Engels theory with Lenin and Stalin in Russia or the later than Soviet Union yeah? You know, the word union always goes back to universal, always goes back to Catholicism. So, since the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan and not Christianity, it doesn't matter whether these Orthodox are under the yoke of Rome or are exterminated by the civil power of communism at that time for Rome. It doesn't matter. The result is the same they are under the yoke of Rome even though that they don't understand it but of course when they are extirpated that is a lot more of um, persecution for the people huh? the people who are betrayed by this orthodox um, religion let's call it yeah? we have to understand that also the orthodox religion the Eastern Orthodox in its basic is Catholic and by that is still not apostolic, is still not the Church of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, of course, we have to pray for these people, like we have to pray for everyone, like Catholics, like Muslims, like Hindus, like Buddhists, all the people who are in these religions which are man-made, we have to try to bring back to the Creator God of the Bible to the only religion that that truly is because there is only one true God and that is the God of the Bible anyway let's go on reading here but the proud nature of the company meaning the company of Jesus would never consider confessing a sin when Antichrist Pope Benedict XV died in 1922 it was ready to start again on a new basis is it not all powerful in Rome let us listen to Monsieur Pierre Dominique. Quote, the new Pope Pius XI, the successor of uh, Benedict XV, who is, according to some, a Jesuit, tries to patch things up. He asks the Jesuit father Derbigny to go to Russia in an attempt to rally whatever is left of Catholicism and especially to see what could be done vague and big hope to rally around the pontiff the persecuted orthodox world yeah he says here this mr dominic says the new pope pius the 11th who is according to some a jesuit now many people will scream oh stop that's not true pope francis is the first jesuit pope um yeah you know Pope Francis may be the first Jesuit Pope that is officially a Jesuit he may be the first white Pope that is a Jesuit under the oath of induction the fourth oath of the Jesuits that's maybe true but I tell you right here right now go back to my reading of rulers of evil go back to my reading of all roads lead to Rome go back to, my, to the beginning of this reading the secret history of the Jesuits and you will understand 
that since the founding of the Jesuits, all white popes have been under the yoke of the Jesuits, under the control of the Jesuits. Remember that when Lorenzo Ricci came to power in, 15, uh, in, in uh, 1758, he was the general that worked all his ministry time to get the Jesuits banished from the whole face of the earth, because I think personally that it's also meant with Revelation 13 that I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, one of the heads of this ten-headed beast out of the sea, yeah, the Jesuits. That's kind of a personal interpretation. I just like to think of it that way, that the banishment of the Jesuits had to do something with that too. And that of course Lorenzo Ricci was working to fulfill Bible prophecy when he banished the Jesuit order. But um, to go back to wh what is important, what I actually wanted to say is um, that we have to understand that the Jesuits always from the beginning had a grip on the Pope. And as you remember, Lorenzo Ricci, uh, Benedict, uh, Benedict, I say, Clement XIII and Clement XIV were both children of him. Uh, Clement XIII only sat in this chair because Lorenzo Ricci allowed it, and uh, Brasci, who became uh, Clement XIV, who then abolished the Jesuits with Dominic Acredemptor, the bull, uh, Lorenzo Ricci even made sure that he became cardinal. So, even when you go back to Pius VII, who was the one who reinstalled the Jesuits in 1814, you have to understand that this uh, reinstallment only happened, of course, because the Jesuits controlled the Pope. So, what are we speaking about when somebody is controlled by the Jesuits? Then we speak of a temporal coadjutor in secular realms. But when we go to the spiritual realm and someone is controlled by the Jesuit, he is at least the same, a Jesuit coadjutor. He is a Jesuit, but he is not a Jesuit priest, even though, of course, Pope Pius is quote-unquote a priest. He may be not a Jesuit priest, but he may be very well a Jesuit. So when the author, or when Pierre Dominique says here, the new Pope Pius XI, who is according to some a Jesuit, I, am, I think that he is absolutely true. He whether is a full-blooded Jesuit, or he is in that much controlled by the Jesuits, that there is no differentiation between whether he is a Jesuit or whether he is a quote-unquote Catholic, <laughs> which is also a Satanist, of course. I just want you to understand that. Okay? So, we continue here. In Rome, the author says, there are 39 ecclesiastical colleges whose foundation marks the dates of great counter-offensives. Most of these counter-offensives were Jesuitical in their working and direction. The very first they erected is the Germanic College. Yeah, you know, that comes from already 1552, 12 years after the inauguration of the Jesuit order. The English, um, uh, the English College uh, is from 1578, the Irish 1628 and re-established in 1826, Interesting that you just have to change the numbers <laughs> these years. The Scottish is from 1600, the North American 1859, and the Canadian from 1888, the Ethiopian 1919 and reconstituted in 1930. Pius XI creates, uh, creates the Russian college, the Pontifico Collegio Russo di San Teresa del Bambino Gesù, and puts it under the Jesuits' care. They also look after the Oriental Institute, the Institute of St. John Damascene, the Polish College, and later the Lithuanian College. Are these reminders of Father Posevino, Ivan the Terrible and the False Dimitri? The second of three great objectives during Ignatius' time takes first place. The Jesuits, once again, are the inspiring agents and performers in that great enterprise. In the defeat they just suffered, the sons of Loyola can see a glimmer of some hope. 
The Russian Revolution, by eliminating the Tsar, protector of the Orthodox Church, had it not decapitated the great rival and helped the penetration of the Roman Church? We must strike while the iron is hot. The famous Russicum is created and its clandestine missionaries will take the, news, uh, the good news to this schismatic country. One century after their uh, explosion by Tsar Alexander I, the Jesuits will again undertake the conquest of the Slav world. Since 1915, their general is Halke von Ledukowski. Here says, it says Nalke, but it's Halke with an H. From Monsieur Pierre Dominique, again a quote. Some will say that I see Jesuits everywhere. <laughs> Some will say that of me, Jörg, too. And I see Jesuits everywhere because they are everywhere, because their teaching is everywhere, because their influence is just everywhere, whether you like it or you're not. So he says, some will say that I see Jesuits everywhere, but I am compelled to point out their presence and actions. To say that they were behind the monarchy of Alfonso the Thirteenth, whose confessor was Father Lopez, that when the Spanish monarchy has ended and their monasteries and colleges burned down, they were found again behind Gil Robles. Then, when civil war broke out, behind Franco. In Portugal, they uphold Salazar. In Austria and Hungary, the Emperor Charles, who was dethroned three times, what part did they play in those attempts to regain the throne of Hungary? Who knows? They kept the seat warm, not knowing much for whom or what. Monsignor Seipel, Dolfus and Schusnik, these are all uh, chancellors of Austria at that time, are from, their, uh, are from their ranks, the ranks of the Jesuits. They dream for a while of a great Germany with a Catholic majority to which the Austrians would necessarily belong. So here you see already what then happened in 1938 with the so-called Anschluss, with the connection of Austria to Germany. It was always a dream of the Roman Catholic Church to have Germany back under Catholic uh, rule. And therefore, that needed to come out of the south of Germany, because the northern part of Germany, as the eastern part, most of, times, uh, most of the part Prussian, was Protestant. But the south belonged to the Catholics, Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, and of course Austria. So they knew that when the Roman Catholic Church wanted to take over, Germany, they had to do it via Berlin, and they have to come from the south. And this is exactly what happened with Hitler, who exactly who was a Austrian. Huh? Never forget that. He was an Austrian, and he was a Catholic, and he gave the power back to Rome. He gave the power of Berlin back from the south. Exactly what Monsieur De Pierre Dominique tells us here. They dream for a while of a great Germany with a Catholic majority to which the Austrians would necessarily belong. A modern version of the old 16th century alliance between the Wittelsbach and the Habsburg. In Italy, they support first of all Don Sturzo, who we will learn of even more than just today. But I'm going to show you a little picture so that you can learn also who Don Sturzo is. He was the founder of the Popular Party in, it, in Italy, and then later on Mussolini. The Jesuit father, Tacchi Venturi, sec, uh, general secretary of the Company of Jesus, served as the middleman between Antichrist Pope Pius XI, whose confessors are fathers Alisiardi and Celebrano, both Jesuits, and Mussolini. Yeah. So Don Sturzo, whose picture you see here on the right, was the founder of the Popular Party, meaning the People Party uh, of Italy at that time. And he, of course, was a Jesuit. The Pope 
In February 1929, at the time of the Treaty of Lateran, calls Mussolini, quote, the man whom Providence allowed us to meet, unquote. Do you get what this sentence means? This is a quote um, from, yeah, I don't know, does, doesn't matter, but the, the point is, the Pope in February 1929, at the time of the Treaty of Lateran, the Lateran Treaty, calls Mussolini the man whom Providence allowed us to meet. What Providence? He is speaking about the providence, he is speaking about what is written in Revelation 13. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and the wound healed. Yeah? The healing of the wound started in 1929 with the Lateran Treaty, when through Mussolini, the Vatican was given back its temporal power. That is the Lateran Treaty all about. That is the healing of the wound of Revelation 13. So that is why Mussolini is seen here as a man of providence. Rome does not condemn what is commonly called the Ethiopian aggression and in 1940 the Vatican is still Mussolini's sincere friend. Now about the Ethiopian aggression we have of course a war that Italy fought in the, northern of, uh, in the north of Africa in Ethiopia and why did they do that? Well, the Muslims have been there for hundreds of years and they have done it and now even the Catholics come back in there and do it. Uh, he is, Mussolini was going on a crusade because the Ethiopian people were Bible-believing Christians. Something that you maybe did not know. And the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian aggression was uh, nevertheless uh, even though Mussolini performed this, he was still a sincere friend of the Vatican. Another quote that comes here from Frederick Hoffitz's uh, L'Equivoque Catholique et le Nouveau Clerialisme, but as I told you before, I'm not going to read all these different um, quotes where they come from. The quote we've just read, of course, comes from Pierre Dominique, as you see here. The Jesuits have their secret abode in it in the Ethiopian aggression, that is. From there, they survey the universal church with the cold and calculating eye of the politician. This is a perfect summary of the Jesuit activity between the two world wars. The quote-unquote secret abode of Loyola sons is the political brain of the Vatican. The confessors of Antichrist Pope Pius XI are Jesuits. Those of his successor, Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli, will also be Jesuits and Germans for good measure. No matter if, because of it, the plot becomes evident, everything, it seems, is ready for revenge. But under the pontificate of Antichrist Pope Pius XI, it is the preparatory period. The Germanic, quote-unquote, secular arm defeated uh, with World War I, has dropped the sword. While waiting to put it back into its hands, we will prepare in Europe a field worth its future exploits and first of all stop the threatening rise of democracy. Italy will be the first field of action. There is there a noisy socialist chief who gathers ex-servicemen around him. This man proclaims an apparently intransient doctrine, but he is ambitious and lucid enough to realize how precarious his position is. In spite of his extravagant boastings, Jesuit diplomacy will soon win him over to its side. M. François Charles of the Institute, who was our, meaning French, ambassador, to the Vatican at that time says, quote, what has Charles Rue, an ambassador to the Vatican, to say? At the time when the future Duce, Mussolini, was only a simple deputy, Cardinal Gaspari, Secretary of State, later Pope Pius XI, had a secret interview with him. The fascist chief had immediately agreed that the Pope should exercise a 
temporal sovereignty over a part of Rome. Ah, unquote. What do we learn here, my dear brethren? We learn here that this was the preparation of the healing of the wound of Revelation 13. The fascist chief had immediately agreed in talks to Cardinal Gaspari, who became, who was this at this moment Secretary of State, and the later Pope Pius XI. Mussolini had immediately agreed that the Pope should exercise temporal sovereignty over a part of Rome. That is what the Vatican is. It is a little state within the city of Rome. When reporting to me about that interview, Cardinal Gaspari concluded, quote, With this promise, I was sure, if this man came to power, we would succeed. Who is we? Well, the Jesuits, on one hand, the Roman Catholic Church on another hand, and Satan on the third. I will not mention his account of the negotiations between the secret agents of Pius XI and Mussolini. These secret agents, the main one being the Jesuit father, Taki Venturi. You're going to see a picture of him right here. Taki Venturi. These secret agents, the main one being Jesuit father Taki Venturi, fulfilled their mission extremely well. This is not surprising when we know that Father Taki Venturi was secretary of the Company of Jesus and Mussolini's confessor at the same time. In fact, he was directed into this casualty of the fascist chief by the general of his order, Halke von Ledokowski, as we are told by Monsieur Gaston Gaillard. Quote, on the 16th of November 1922, Parliament elected Mussolini by 306 votes against 116, and in that meeting, one saw the Catholic group of Don Sturzo, Don Sturzo, one saw the Catholic, um, I've, I've lost it here, <laughs> of Don Sturzo, supposedly Christian Democrat, voting unanimously for the first fascist government. That is what Gaston Gaillard has to say about this. Ten years later, the same maneuver brought about a similar result in Germany. The Catholic Zentrum of Monsignor Kass assured by its massive vote the dictatorship of Nazism. Monsignor Kass, a Jesuit and a leader of the Zentrum, the Center Party in Germany, a right-wing party, a Catholic party, and by the way, for the people who do not know, the precursor of the CDU, the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, of which Angela Merkel today is Chancellor of Germany since 2005. They are all interconnected. So, very interesting. Ten years later, we are speaking here about November 22, and of course, we, with Hitler, we are speaking about January 1933. The same maneuver brought about a similar result in Germany. The Catholic Zentrum of Monsignor Kass in this picture here is assured by its massive vote the dictatorship of Nazism of Adolf Hitler of the NSDAP. In fact, Italy had been, in 1922, the trial ground for the new formula of authoritarian conservatism, which you can also call fascism, dressed up when local circumstances demanded it with some pseudo-socialism. <laughs> That's why it's called National Socialism. From now on, all the efforts of the Vatican's Jesuits will tend to spread this doctrine in Europe, 
the ambiguity of which is typical of them. And I can assure you that same is coming to the United States of America. Not only because of Operation Paperclip and all the imported Nazis after the Second World War, but also because uh, the Jesuits say for themselves in their, uh, in their magazine that fascism is the policy that comes closest to the, uh, to the ideals of the Jesuit party. We will go into that a little bit later. Uh. So, even today, <coughs> the author says, the collapse of Mussolini's regime, nor the defeat, nor the ruins, have been enough to discredit to the eyes of Italy's Christian Democrats the megalomaniac dictator imposed on their country by the Vatican. Disowned only outwardly, his prestige remains intact in the hearts of the clerics. The following could be read in the press. Quote, and now have a look at this. We have decided. Victors, uh, visitors coming to Rome for the Olympic Games in 1960 will see the marble obelisk erected by Benito Mussolini and his own glory as it dominates from the banks of the Tiber, the Olympic Stadium. This memorial, 33 meters high, bears the inscription Mussolini Dux of Duce. Here you can read this, Mussolini Dux. I have another picture here. You see how big it is, 33 meters high. Of course, 33 is a Masonic number, as you all know. And this is uh, in a detail of a mosaic floor with men hailing their leader, the Duccio, the Duccio, between the Mussolini obelisk and the Olympic Stadium. So the visitors walk over this mosaic floor. But let's keep this obelisk a little bit in picture during the reading for the next few moments at least. You can see that where has ever been the fascism of Mussolini been damned in Italy? Good question, eh? when they still have this obelisk even today. So the author continues here. Uh, this memorial, 33 meters high, uh, bears the inscription Mussolini Dux and is decorated with mosaics, of which I just uh, show you, showed you, um, mosaics and inscriptions praising fascism. The phrase "Long live the Duce" is repeated more than one hundred times, and the slogan "Many enemies mean much honor." several times as well. The monument has, on either side, marble blocks commemorating the main events of fascism, from the foundation of the publication Popolo d'Italia by Mussolini until the establishment of the short-lived fascist empire and including the war in Ethiopia, the crusade that Mussolini had against Protestants. The obelisk was to be crowned with a gigantic statue of Mussolini as a naked athlete, athlete nearly 100 meters high. But the regime collapsed before this strange project could be realized. Quote, After a year of controversy, the Segni government has just decided that the Duchess obelisk should stay. So they didn't complete the 100 meter big great figure of Mussolini on top of the obelisk here, but they left the obelisk. The war, the blood which flowed profusely, the tears and the ruins do not matter. They are mere trifles, small spots on the monument erected to the glory of, quote, the man whom providence allowed us to meet, unquote, as he was described by Antichrist Pope Pius XI. No shortcomings, mistakes or crimes can erase his main merit. The fact that he re-established the temporal power of the Pope 
Lateran Treaty of 1929, proclaimed Roman Catholicism as the religion of the state, with a concordat signed along with it, of course. and gave the clergy through laws still being enforced complete power over the life of the nation. It is to testify too that that uh, the, it is to testify to this that Mussolini's obelisk must stand in the heart of Rome for the benefit of foreign tourists looking at it admiringly or ironically and in the hope of better times which would allow the erection of the naked athlete 100 meters high, symbolic champion of the Vatican. If they're gonna erect that figure ever, ever, I don't know, I don't care, but even the plans that they have say enough, don't they, don't you think? Now the Lateran Treaty, by which Mussolini showed his gratitude to the papacy, gave the Holy See, apart from the payment of 1,750 million liras, which is converted into British pounds 20 million at the time, the temporal sovereignty over the territory of Vatican City. Now, let's read this again, that we understand it, please. The Lateran Treaty, by which Mussolini showed his gratitude to the papacy, gave the Holy See, the Vatican, apart from the payment of 750 million liras, the temporal sovereignty over the territory of Vatican City, and by that the temporal sovereignty over the whole world, the healing of the wound. Now I've made a little comment here, and before I'm going to read any further, I'm going to read to you this little comment that I prepared here. Sometimes I have times to prepare comments, and in this case it was so. It says more on this info, uh, the payment of the 20 million pounds um, and how this even converts into dollars and how the Vatican used that money later the same year because you have to understand the signing of the Lateran Treaty was on the uh, I don't know the 11th of February something in the beginning of February 1929 yeah? and then the papacy got paid this 750 million lira by Mussolini and how they used that money later the same year to buy all the stocks worldwide after the crash of Black Friday 1929. This information is to be found in Avro Manhattan's book The Vatican Billions. But I'm gonna give you a little context of it in short. And let's see if I have here a picture of 1929. I prepared that one for you. The greatest crash in Wall Street's history. Black Friday. Uh, this money, the 750 million lira, or 750 million times 1000 lira, which is at least 20 million British pounds at that time, this money was used to buy all stocks at a penny for a dollar and today, 2017 even, through different papal knighthoods the Vatican controls the world's economy in accordance with Revelation 13 verse, uh, 18 verse 3 quote, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicac uh, del delicacies. Now, who are the merchants of this earth? Through the different papal knighthoods, like the Knights of Malta, first and for all, the Jesuit order, who control the Knights of Malta. They are the merchants of this earth, and they got absolute control over the whole worldwide economy by playing a part in this crash in 1929, when a few months before the Vatican got paid at least these 20 million pounds. And they were then able to form this bourse crash, yeah, this stock market crash worldwide, and to buy all the companies for a penny uh, for a penny or for the dollar. 
quite a repetition of what they did in 1815 after Waterloo with the Central Bank of England. How the Rothschilds got control on that, because they were of course uh, informed by the Jesuits. Because the Rothschilds are only Jesuit agents, as you know. Anyway, let's continue in this book. It is certain, the author says here, that the constitution of the Vatican City was a matter of prime importance in order to establish the papacy as a political power. Yeah, and that of course is pure biblical prophecy. Revelation 13, the healing of the wound that has begun in 1929. We will not waste time trying to conciliate this explicit confession with the phrase so often heard that, quote, the Roman Catholic Church is not involved in politics, unquote. <laughs> it's the whole existence they have. We will only point out the unique position in the world of a state, which is secular and sacred, of equivocal nature as well, and as the uh, and the consequences of that position the roman catholic church is a state google that information <coughs> sorry google that information that is no secret the roman catholic church is a state yeah what are the Jesuitical crafty tricks used by this power which, depending on circumstances, makes use of her temporal and spiritual character to be exempted from all the rules laid down by international laws? <laughs> yeah, go back to my reading of um, Martin Luther And where I read in the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, as you can see right here. And there you will learn about exactly that fact. Eh? I have an own playlist Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, a book written and published by Martin Luther in 1545 that uh, biblically and historically explains to you that the papacy and only the papacy is the Antichrist. And within this book, we learn that the rule maker, let's call it simple in, in simple words, the rule maker does not adhere to the rules he makes for others. And Martin Luther points that out in that book too. So I don't go into that, but I just want to advise you, if you haven't watched these videos, go to the playlist against the Roman papacy and the institution of the devil and you will learn about that. For the moment I have uploaded, I don't know, six, five or six parts and there are in total 19 parts of that book reading to come. So a lot for you to learn. The nations themselves have lent their hand to this trickery and by doing that helped its penetration into their midst the Trojan Horse of Clericalism. Highlighted because I think this is a very important or interesting sentence. The Trojan Horse of clerical Clericalism. Quote, The Pope seemed to identify himself too much with the dictators, wrote M. François Charroux, French ambassador to the Vatican. But could it be otherwise, when the Holy See itself had raised these men to power? Mussolini, the prototype, was the inaugurator of that series of providential men, these sword-bearers who would prepare the revenge for 1918. From Italy, where it prospered so well under the care of Jesuit father Tacchi Venturi and his acolytes, fascism was soon to be exported to Germany. Quote, Hitler receives his impetus from Mussolini. The ideal of the Nazis is the same as in Italy, since Mussolini is at the head. All the sympathies are for Berlin. In 1923, his fascism merges with National Socialism. He becomes friends with Hitler, to whom he supplies arms and money. Now, 
we have to go back to the pictures here that I can show you the next one which is quite interesting I guess here you see Cardinal Eugenio Percelli the future Pope Pius XII waving hand to greet military officials now at that time the author continues Monsignor Pacelli, future Pope Pius XII, and then the curious best diplomat, is nuncio in Munich, from 1917 on, for your information, capital of Catholic Bavaria. There, the star of the future German dictators starts to rise. He is also a Catholic, like his most important associates. Of that country, cradle of Nazism, Mem M. Maurice Laporte tells us, quote, Its two enemies are called Protestantism and democracy. Prussia's anxiety is therefore understandable. Quote, it is easy to guess what kind of special care the Vatican gives Bavaria where Hitler's National Socialism recruits its strongest contingents. Unquote. To take from heretic Prussia the control of the German secular arm, and transfer it to Catholic Bavaria? What a dream! Monsignor Pacelli puts all in his power to realize it, acting in concert with the chief of the company of Jesus, Lerakowski. Listen, I told you in the beginning of this broadcast that was the plan all along. Take the power from Protestant Prussia and give it to Catholic Bavaria and their allies, Austria. And where did Hitler come from? Austria. Quote, After the other war, means the First World War between 1914 and 18, the Jesuits general Halke von Ledokowski, and I'm going to pull a picture right in here that you see him, had conceived a vast plan. The creation, with or without Emperor Habsburg, of a federation of the Catholic nations in Central and Eastern Europe. Austria, Slovakia, Bohemia, Poland, Hungary, Croatia, and, of course, Bavaria. We will learn how all these countries have become Catholic, and Croatia in special. There is going to be a lot to be talked about during the Second World War, and the Ostashis, and the Serbs, who were Orthodox, and also Protestants, and how they have been quote unquote converted to Catholicism. This is all upcoming in the reading of this book. So I can only ask your patience and that you will stay with me and keep continue reading and learning from this book. Reading and learning the history that is never taught to you in the schools, that is never taught to you in the universities, that is never taught to you by any pastor in any church. It is the duty of the clerics to inform the people about politics when politics are mingled with religion. And the Roman Catholic Church is nothing else but the mingling of politics with religion. And what pastor in what church does speak to you about that? I'd like to hear it. Another quote continues in the book. This new central empire, uh, as we just read here, um, a federation of Catholic nations in Central and Eastern Europe, Austria, Slovakia, Bohemia, Poland, Hungary, Croatia and of course Bavaria, this new Central Empire had to fight on two fronts. So a lot of people condemn Hitler for starting a two-front war on the East and on the West. But here you see that these plans have already been laid much earlier, even before Hitler came to power. On the eastern side, it says, against the Soviet Union, and on the western side, against Prussia, against Protestant Great Britain, and Republican, rebellious France, because they had to be punished. At that time, Monsignor Eugenio Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII, was nuncio in Munich, 
nuncio, meaning he was the highest representative of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany. Then in Berlin, because he moved then from Munich to Berlin, as did the power that went to Berlin, the Roman Catholic power, and an intimate friend of Cardinal Faulhaber, von Ledukowski's main collaborator. The Ledukowski plan was the dream of Antichrist Pope Pius XII's use. But was it only a dream of youth? The Middle Europa, or Mid-Europe, Hitler, tried to organize, was very similar to that plan, apart from the presence in that block of Lutheran Prussia, a not very dangerous minority and the recognized zones of influence which, maybe temporarily, belonged to Italy. In fact, it was the Ledakowski plan, adapted to the needs of the times, which the Führer was trying to realize under the patronage of the Holy See, with the help of Franz von Papen, secret chamberlain of the Pope, and the nuncio to Munich, then Berlin, Monsignor Pacelli. François Charles Roux writes, quote, During the contemporary epoch, world Politics never felt the Catholic intervention more than during the ministry of Monsignor Pacelli. And from Joseph Roven we read, quote, Now, Catholic Bavaria is going to welcome and protect all those who sow trouble and all those confederates and assassins of the De La Sainte Vim. Now, what is the De la Saint Vim, what does this talk about? And I looked it up because I didn't want you to be as ignorant as me about it because Saint Vim didn't say anything to me. And if you know already what it's about, I'm sorry, I didn't want to call anybody stupid, but there are a lot of things sometimes in this book that I don't understand, and when I have the time on beforehand to look them up, as I had this time because I had this operation on my tooth. And then I'm going to look this up and bring to you the information. What is he talking about here? Roven says, the Catholic, now Catholic Bavaria is going to welcome and protect all those who sow trouble. Trouble for the Roman Catholic Church, of course. All those confederates and assassins of de la Sainte Vem. Now, the Vemic courts, it says, the Vemgericht, Holy Vem, or simply Vem, also spelled Feme, Femegericht, Femegericht are names given to a proto-vigilant tribunal system of Westphalia in Germany, active during the later Middle Ages, based on a fraternal organization of lay judges called free judges, Freischöffen oder Frangjuge, in French. The original seat of the courts was in Dortmund. Proceedings were sometimes secret, leading to the alternative titles of secret courts, which in German is Heimliches Gericht, silent courts, a Stillgericht in German, or even forbidden courts, verbotene Gerichte. After the execution of a death sentence, the corpse could be hung on a tree to advertise the fact and deter others, a Wien or on a miniature in Herfurder Rechtsbuch. A peak of activity of these courts was during the 14th and 15th centuries, with lesser, lesser activity attested to the 13th and 16th centuries, and scattered evidence establishing their continued existence during the 17th and 18th centuries. They were finally abolished by order of Jerome Bonaparte, King of Westphalia, in 1811. Now, if you still don't get it, we are talking about secret tribunals, yeah? As we said here, silent courts, forbidden courts, secret courts. This is actually what the Inquisition was all about. So, Mr. Roven says, Catholic Bavaria is going to welcome and protect all those who sow trouble, all those confederates and assassins of the De La Sainte Vim. Assassins of De La Sainte Vim means people who wanted to abolish the working of the Inquisition. You get it? Going back to Trentine 
politics, going back to the Inquisition. This is what the sentence says, and therefore I thought this little explanation was quite interesting and necessary. From amongst these agitators, the author continues, the choice of Germany's regenerators will fall upon Adolf Hitler, who is destined to triumph over the demo uh, democratic mistakes under the Holy Father's standard. Of course, Adolf Hitler, he is a Catholic, like his principal collaborators. Quote, the Nazi regime is like a return to the government of southern Germany. The names and origins of its chiefs demonstrated. Hitler is specifically Austrian, Göring is Bavarian, Goebbels is Rhenish, and so on." Unquote. In 1924 the Holy See signs a concordat with Bavaria. In 1927 we can read in Cologne's Gazette, Pope Pius XI is certainly the most German Pope who ever sat on the throne of St. Peter. Interesting, huh? Pope Pius XI is certainly the most German Pope who ever sat on the throne of St. Peter. His successor, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, Eugene de Pacelli, will even rob him of this palm. But, for the time being, the pursues, he pursues his diplomatic career rather his political career, in this Germany for which, as he later told Ribbentrop, quote, he would always have a special affection, unquote. And let me assure you, not because he loves Germany, but because he loves to tread on it. The Jesuits are never loyal to any country. They never love any country, and when they say, that he, uh, like in this case, Pope Pius XII, will have a special affection for it, it only means that he has a special hatred for it. That's what they actually mean. Don't forget that these people say one thing and mean another. Now, promoted Nuncio in Berlin, he works with Franz von Papen at destroying the Weimar Republic. Yeah, that is the fake democracy that was installed into Germany after the losing of the, se uh, of the First World War. On the 20th of July in 1932, a state of siege is proclaimed in Berlin and the ministers expelled Manu Militari. Uh, this means with a military hand. Uh, remember, the Jesuits are a military order, so they uh, expel the ministers militarily. It is the first step towards Hitlerian dictatorship in 1932, the 20th of July in 1932. New elections are prepared which will establish the success of the Nazis only a few months later. Quote, with Hitler's approval, Göring and Strasser got in contact with Monsignor Kahrs, party chief of the Catholic Center. Let's put up another picture of Kars once again, huh? as we have already seen here, Monsignor Kars, okay, whom you know. With Hitler's approval, Göring and Strasser got in contact with Monsignor Kars, here in the picture, party chief of the Catholic Center. Cardinal Bertram, Archbishop of Breslau and Primate of Germany, declared, quote, we, Christians and Catholics, <laughs> What, what, what kind of a declaration is that? When a Roman Catholic Cardinal, Archbishop, declares Christians and Catholics, does he make a distinction between Christians and Catholics? Or does he proclaim Catholics to be Christians? Quite interesting, you know. Every time these people open their mouths, you really have to watch every word that comes out of them. We, Christians and Catholics, Cardinal Bertram says, do not recognize any religion or race. Unquote. With many other bishops, he tried to warn the faithful against the pagan ideal of the Nazis. Obviously, this prelate had not understood papal politics, but he was soon going to be taught. <laughs> and otherwise, if found a liberal, 
put into a concentration camp and extirpated. Now, let's see how much time have we got. Ah, it's already an hour, so I'm going to stop the reading here and then we will continue next time with the um, with the quote, quote from the Mercure de France, which gave an excellent study in 1934, and that's a nice point next time to continue, and uh, we'll see when we will turn to Chapter 7 of this, uh, The Secret Terrorists, World War II, maybe the next reading or the one after, but I'm going to tell you already now, it's going to come anyway. So, I thank you very much for watching this video and for listening and for commenting and when you have any questions I'm glad to hear them in the comment section of the video and uh, until next time Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says God bless you and bye bye a special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, They've been in preparation and, and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, Welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine of the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From their own, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.